Hi, this is Pastor Daryl Myatt from Keller, Texas. Today is Tuesday, April 4th, 2017. This channel is all about world news, Bible prophecy, end time events, and the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Forgive me, I'm a little casual today. I'm about to go outside and grill on the grill. We're going to have some cheeseburgers and chicken and yummy good stuff. And it's a beautiful day in Texas. And... And also, for those of you who, who know me, who uh, have seen the things I've been doing the last few years, um, our foreign exchange student son, Malik, is coming to visit us this weekend. He'll be here for a, a week or more, and my daughter is also coming to visit, so we're going to have a great Easter weekend of uh, all my family here, all my family. Uh, we're going to have a nice time visiting with everybody, so it's going to be quite special. Anyway, there's a lot of people, a lot of families all over the world today that aren't quite feeling that love. They're not quite feeling the warm and fuzzies. I don't know if you've seen the news or not, but there was a horrible chemical attack in Syria. I watched a few videos and was just appalled at the horrible painful deaths that a lot of people, including women and children, were suffering because of this chemical attack in Syria. Out of United with Israel, Netanyahu shocked and outraged by Syrian chemical attack. He said, when I saw pictures of babies suffocating from chemical attack in Syria, I was shocked and outraged. This story says more than 60 people were killed in this chemical weapon strike by either Syrian or Russian army jets. Today, in Syria's northwestern province of Idlib, um, British-based Syrian Observatory for Human Rights is reporting this story. I saw another story just moments before starting to film that said over a hundred people were dead so far in this chemical attack. In the videos, people are stripping down to almost naked and, and people are hosing them off with water to try to rinse these chemicals off of them. But there's other people in the videos that are just like gasping for air that they never get foaming at the mouth and, and vomiting and, and dying a very painful death. Chemical weapons. And of course, the Syrian government's not commenting, although they've been accused of using chemical warfare before. So I don't know who's to blame, if it's Syria or Russia. According to this story, they weren't sure which planes were dropping these chemical weapons. But it's horrible over there. In Syria, it's not a good time at all. Babies suffocating from chemical attacks in Syria. You know, there's no excuse for deliberate attacks on civilians and children, especially with outlawed chemical weapons. Netanyahu's calling on the international community to fulfill its obligation from 2013 to fully and finally remove these horrible chemical weapons from Syria. And then there's Russia. Uh, out of the Washington Post, bomb in St. Petersburg subway killing 11. Sets a city on edge. Again, I saw another newer story than this one that said, oh, now the death toll is up to 21 and uh, 30 injured and more in Russia, in a subway system, where two central subway stations in Russia's second largest city killed at least 11 people, injured at least 30 more. Terrorism. Terrorism all over the place. And this is amazing to me. Here's a story out of Ynet News. Suspect in St. Petersburg Metro Blast linked to radical Islamists. Anyone shocked? How much longer is this world going to tell you this is a peaceful religion? When every time we turn on the news and we hear stories of someone killing someone, it's a Muslim. How much longer is the world going to lie to you and say, oh, it's a religion of peace? There's no peace. There's no peace in Islam. You know why? It's because they don't know the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ the Son of the Living God. 
the, the Savior of the world, the Messiah that was prophesied, God in human flesh, the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. It's because they don't know him. And they're trying to prove to the world that their God is greater. Their God is greater than this Christian God. And I'll prove it because I'll kill you. It's like this insecurity they have about their false God. Allahu Akbar. They say my God is greater right before they shoot somebody or blow up a bomb that takes out innocent civilians and children. This is not a religion of peace. They're told to kill those who don't believe the way they believe. Why does the world want to tell you it's a religion of peace? It's not. They kill their enemies. If you want to call a religion, any religion, a religion of peace, why don't you look at Christianity? They pray for their enemies. They give food and water to their enemies. They pray for those who seek to kill them. That's peace. That's peace. That goes against what the world says. The world says an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. You do this to me, I'll do it to you. Christians say, oh, you want to kill me? I hope and pray that God will open your eyes to the truth of Jesus Christ. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's true peace. This suspect in this bomb blast in Russia linked to radical Islam. How do you know? Here's another story. ISIS celebrates St. Petersburg Metro Blast that killed 14. Who celebrates death of anybody? Celebrating death. I don't know about you guys, but I like to celebrate life. ISIS supporters are praising this explosion on a St. Petersburg subway train that has killed at least 14 in this story, injured dozens more, according to Russian media reports. Here's a guy who says, we, ble we ask Allah to bless the operation by the lions of the caliphate. We ask Allah to kill the crusaders. They're praying for their enemies to die. They're praying for the infidels to die. Who's an infidel? Those who don't believe the way these twisted Muslims believe. They reject the truth from heaven, but accept a lie from hell. And they want to make sure everyone else accepts this lie from hell. Who does that? Demons? Antichrists? Those who don't know the truth? Fools, the Bible says? Jesus said they're condemned already in John 3.18 if they deny the Son of God. They're condemned. Condemned is not a good thing. They're headed to hell because they deny the only one who can save them. They say, oh yeah, Jesus, hey, he was a good man, but he's not the Son of God. He didn't die on a cross and he didn't rise again from the dead and he's certainly not God in flesh. He was just a good man, a good prophet, a teacher of Islam. Another lie from those who worship a great liar. I hate to keep beating a dead horse, but Islam is the way to hell. Jesus Christ is the way to everlasting life. There's a big difference. People celebrating death are not following the one true God. I can tell you that. Amazing times we're living in. Out of Reuters, Trump tells Egypt's Sisi that the United States and Egypt will fight Islamic militants together. I find that an interesting headline. Telling a leader of a country that's 94% Muslim, telling him we're going to fight the Islamic radicals together. Makes you wonder. Um... But it's important, I think, for world leaders to get together, to meet, to try to have peace, to try to learn to love and support and help each other. Donald Trump says, Mr. President, you have a great friend and ally in the United States and in me. He, he stood up for CC, who has been under the thumb of Obama for the last several years. President Trump said, I just want to let everybody know, in case there was any doubt, that we are very much behind President Sisi. He's done a fantastic job in a very difficult situation. We're very much behind Egypt and the people of Egypt. 
Well said. Well spoken. Out of Fox News, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un desperate and ready to strike the United States according to a defector. A defector from the regime said yesterday that Kim Jong-un is desperate and ready to strike the United States with a nuclear weapon. He, he's desperate to maintain his rule by relying on his nuclear weapons and intercontinental ballistic missiles. And once he sees there's any kind of sign of a tank or an imminent threat from America, he's going to use his nuclear weapons with an ICBM, intercontinental ballistic missile, and strike at America. Hmm. Interesting. Um, <laughs> most of their missile tests have not hit their targets. Of course, America is a big target. Maybe they could hit that. I don't know. Um, very interesting to learn that he's growing desperate to stay in power and ready to use a nuclear bomb to do so. How about this? Out of the San Francisco gate, uh, cyborgs at work, employees getting implanted with chips. Um, I'm sorry, this is, S, this is SF gate. I mistakenly said San Francisco. Um, this is out of Stockholm, Sweden. Talking about everyone being injected with these chips, creating cyborgs. Uh, this company, uh, what's the name of this company? Epicenter. It implants its workers with microchips the size of a grain of rice that functions as swipe cards to open doors, operate printers, buy smoothies with the wave of a hand. These injections have become so popular that workers at the epicenter hold parties for those willing to get implanted. Can you see anything here? Sounds exactly like the mark of the beast, doesn't it? This is the exact kind of technology I think will be used to implement the mark of the beast. These RFID chips implanted right here in the right hand, just like the Bible says. And you watch Apple or some other giant corporation, some giant company in the next few years will probably be saying, here's the greatest security benefit ever. And people are going to line up like sheep to the slaughter to get the latest and greatest, most incredible technology that you can't live without. However, it will kill you forever. The Bible says not to take the mark. If they come out with something that they say, oh, you have to have this in order to buy or sell anything, run, okay? That's when we're going to start creating some secret societies, some Christian communes, some underground whatever. We who know the truth are going to gather together. We'll live off the land. We'll do what we have to do. We'll do what we have to do. God will provide. You know, the, the Hebrews, the, the Israelites were wandering through the desert for 40 years. Their shoes didn't wear out. God fed them, gave them water and shelter every day. Same God yesterday, today, and forever. We're talking a period of three and a half years, seven at the most. <laughs> Same God. He's quite capable of meeting our needs. You just need to trust in him and understand that you need to trust God and not trust in the government of man. Because the government of man is going to lead you astray and they're going to demand that you take this mark. Because there's one coming who will be leading a one world government. You know who he is. Anyway, let's get into the word. In 2 Timothy 2, starting in verse 11, says, it is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we believe not, yet he abides faithful, he cannot deny himself. He cannot deny himself. Here's Paul writing his last letter before he's executed, addressing it to Timothy. Uh, it, it kind of his spiritual son, his, his protege, the guy he's hoping will carry on in his work. I think people are convinced that Paul is quoting from an ancient Christian worship chorus or a hymn. 
Now, it's believed to be one of the songs that Christians sang as they were walking into the arena to face certain death where the lions would be released and they would be devoured. Paul himself may have sung this hymn when he was executed in Rome. There's a lot of historical evidence that people of the pagan world were amazed at the courage and the joy of Christians as, as they were facing certain death. Um, some people of the early church, uh, Tertullian, was reportedly converted soon after he first observed this exhibition of abnormal joyfulness over facing death of a Christian believer. He, he made this statement that the blood of the martyrs is seed. Seed. Hmm. Christ calls us. And when he does, we die to sin. We die to ourselves. There's a song that says, We've already, we have already died with him and we will therefore live with him. It goes on to say that when we endure, we reign with him. If we deny him, he'll deny or disown us. But when we are faithless, he always remains faithful because it's a characteristic of his unchanging nature. Unchanging nature. People dying as martyrs for the faith, standing up for what they believe in, saying, I'm going to stand strong on God's word. I don't care what kind of lies, what kind of deception you throw my way. I'm going to believe Jesus Christ is the only way to God the Father. He died on the cross. He rose again from the dead. And he's coming back again, just like he said. I'm not going to fall for lies of any other, any other gospel, any other word. I'm not going to fall for the lies of Islam. I'm not going to fall for the lies of Buddhism. I'm not going to fall for the lies of Scientology or atheism or uh, New Age whatever. Christ is the only way to God the Father. The world gnashes its teeth when they hear this. Oh, not that word. They don't want to hear there's just one way. They want to believe that all roads lead to God. Everyone's going to heaven. We're going to have Muslims and atheists and Christians and Scientologists and, and Buddhists and, and Mormons and monks and and nuns and priests and everyone just sitting around a big campfire singing kumbaya, holding hands, loving each other, and all going to heaven. This one big heavenly train. Sorry. Hate to burst your bubble, but that's not the truth. The truth is Jesus Christ. He said himself in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God the Father but by me. That means there is no other way to God except through Jesus Christ, the Son, Lord and Savior, the King of kings, Lord of lords. All power and authority of heaven and earth has been given to Christ. He's God in human flesh. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. In 1 John 5, verse 7, it says there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Three or one. We serve one God. We worship one God. The fact that God has appeared in three different forms doesn't mean it's three gods. It's one God. Three forms. In the same way that water can be solid, liquid, and gas. It's still H2O. One God. Muslims love to say, oh, you guys worship three gods. No, we don't. We worship one God who's appeared in three forms. Who are you to say what God can do? Who are you to try to put God in a box? Who are you to say God can't appear in such a way? I serve one God. John 3, 16, probably the most famous scripture of all, the Holy Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Everlasting life. You know, you keep hearing of people talking, oh, yeah, Muslims, Christians, they worship the same God. No, that's a lie. First and foremost, my God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross to save us from sin, to save us from death, to save us from hell and the flesh and the devil. In Islam, Allah has no son. 
It's blasphemy to say he has an heir, that he has a son. It's blasphemy. That alone disqualifies anyone saying we worship the same God. I can give you about 30 more things that disqualify Islam and Christianity as worshiping the same God. Hmm. Since 9-11, since every terrorist attack you've heard of that Muslims celebrate, that ISIS celebrates, what just happened in London, you're going to hear that all faiths are divisive. All faiths have some deadly aspect to them. We need to be tolerant of other faiths. We need to, uh, you know, sacrifice the truth of the gospel. You need to compromise on some of these things you demand to be true. No, I don't. Christ is the only way. There's no other name under heaven by which you must be saved. Jesus said, I will come again. I'm going to go and prepare a place for you, and I will come again. And I'll receive you so that you can be where I am. I can tell you right now, I don't want to be where Muhammad is, because he denied Jesus. So yeah, he's burning in hell. And everyone who follows after him and his false gospel will end up there also. That's why I speak the truth of Christ. I'm hoping and praying that I can send a roadblock, send a message to those who are on this highway to hell and say, look, wrong road, make a U-turn, exit here. Here's a, here's a way to be saved. His name is Jesus and he died to save you. We're characterized as Christians, as believers, to have peace and love. But we're not to give in or give up on our convictions, these things we know to be true, and certainly not give credibility to another false religion or a false gospel. The truth of Jesus Christ divides people. Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. Christ preached the message of love and forgiveness. But he made it clear that not all gods are created equal. There's only one way to God, and he's the only way. There is no other. See, the people of this world don't like the gospel of Christ. They see it as narrow-minded and, and, and divisive. You know, Jesus said narrow is the path that leads to life, and few find it. So yeah, I guess in a way, I am narrow-minded. I'm thinking about that path. That path that is called Jesus. And if you want to call me narrow-minded because I know the truth, I don't care. I've been called every name and every curse word you can think of. I've been given death threats by the dozens. I'm still here preaching Christ and Him crucified as the only way to God the Father. You know, the world praises the idea of one religion that unifies everyone of all colors, of all race, of all countries, of all cultures. And you know what? This is coming upon the earth. It's prophesied. There will be a one world, one world religion. Uh, Daniel speaks of it. Revelation speaks of it. Even Isaiah speaks of it. But it's going to be the religion of evil. It's going to be an anti Christ religion in the times of the end. And we're seeing so many people right now that are so going to be ones going, hey, I like this thing. I like this guy. He says good stuff. Let's follow after him. Yay, this is a feel-good religion until he turns on you. Yeah, the devil makes a lot of promises. It's like politicians on the campaign trail. Oh, sure, you can keep your doctor. You can keep your insurance. <laughs> And then what? Yeah, your, uh, your bill tripled or quadrupled and you can't keep your doctor. It's kind of like that. The devil's a liar. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he's the father of lies, Jesus said. Jesus Christ is the prince of peace. Christ is the only answer to problems of this world. We must never compromise on the truth of God's word. We must never give in on our convictions. No matter what they do to us, no matter what they say about us, no matter what they threaten us with. 
In Matthew 6, verse 1, Jesus said, Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them, otherwise you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. What's your motivation? You know, the, the motive behind your gift is more important than the gift itself. You know, Paul said if he gave all his goods to feed the poor, or if he made the ultimate sacrifice of giving his own life for someone else, and it wasn't motivated by love, his gift would profit him nothing. 1 Corinthians 13, 3. You know, a lot of Christians faithfully give week after week at yeah, church. You know, they write out the check, or they, they drop a C note in the plate as it's passing by, but they never see that hundredfold return that the Lord promised because they have the wrong motives. Mark 10, 29 through 30. Paul said God loves a cheerful giver, not one who gives grudgingly or out of debt or out of contempt. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7. Jesus kind of gave us the key to making sure that our motives were pure in this teaching. He said, but when thou dost alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. Matthew 6, verse 3. Giving in a way that you won't receive any kind of recognition for your gifts will guarantee that your motives are right and give you the true joy that comes through selfless giving. Acts 20, verse 24. So if you're giving so you can have a good tax write-off, or if you're giving so, you know, that, that cute brunette down the aisle will see you put something in, you're hoping to maybe go have lunch with her after church, or if you're giving because you want to make sure that the preacher knows that next time you complain about the temperature in the church, he'll turn the thermostat down because he saw you giving. <laughs> Wrong motives. Wrong motives. Or if you think, oh, if I throw some money in the plate, I'll go to heaven. Yeah, no. You can't buy your way into heaven. Or you would see Oprah there and Bill Gates and all the richest people in the world. I have a feeling not going to be a whole lot of rich people there. There will be some. Ask God to show you an opportunity or, or a way today where you can give a kind word or, or you can help someone out or maybe do something for someone who can't possibly repay you. Or doing something for someone where no one will ever know you did it. You'll never receive any accolades, no pats on the back, no attaboys. You're just doing it out of love. Because you love God and you love others. You know, maybe you're in a traffic jam. You see somebody on the side of the road. Their, their car is overheating and steaming. Their hood's up. You're just like, yeah, I'm a little busy. I'm going two miles an hour, but I'm too busy to help that guy. I should be home about an hour. Got to make dinner. Uh, Got to let the dogs out. We're all busy. We all have somewhere to go, some place to be, someone to meet. It takes a little time. That's why it's called sacrifice. Because you're doing something it's going to cause you to miss out on something you had planned to do. Um, maybe a coworker, someone at work, or a spouse, or a kid who won't even notice something nice that you do for them, or all kinds of people. There's all opportunities all around us. All around us. I've had people recently really coming down on me because I talk about Bible prophecy. They're like, what are you talking about Bible prophecy for? Yeah, that's kind of silly. That's kind of a waste of time. You're distracting yourself from the gospel. <laughs> really? Let me, um, let me read something to you from God's holy Bible. In, uh, what am I looking for? Ah, Revelation 19 in verse 10. The last part of the verse says, For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. You want to tell me prophecy is worthless? That it's a, a, a worthless pursuit? It's a waste of time? People think, oh, why does Bible prophecy matter? You shouldn't spend time studying Bible prophecy. 
You know, it's so negative. It's gloom and doom. Really? A waste of time? Gloom and doom? A negative thing? How can the return of Jesus Christ the King be a negative thing? I can tell you how. It's negative for those who don't know him because then they're going to face everlasting hell. It's negative for them. It's glory and joy for those of us who know him as Lord, Savior, and King. Um, in Revelation 21, verse 4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Does that sound negative to you? Does that sound like something I shouldn't be looking forward to? Does that sound like something I shouldn't waste my time with? People love to criticize Bible prophecy. You know, they're like, oh, you one of those date setters? You one of those guys that telling me when something's going to happen? No, but I can tell you something is going to happen. I can tell you Damascus is going to be completely destroyed. I can tell you that there's going to be one called the Antichrist that demands you to worship him to the point that he gives you a mark. And without it, you can't buy or sell. I can tell you that Israel is going to look like they're going to be completely defeated, surrounded by armies. And then God comes in and fights against those who fight against Jerusalem. I can tell you that Christ will return. It's going to happen. I don't know when. I would never be so foolish as to try to tell you when. But Christ is our blessed hope. I think a lot of people, and church leaders included, Ignore Bible prophecy because they care more about what the world thinks than what God thinks. I think they're more concerned with what that big uh, tithe giver thinks than what God thinks. I think they're more concerned with the, the weekly intake of offerings so they can continue keeping the lights on, so they can continue paying all these preachers and teachers in the church. I know some churches that have a million dollar a week budget. That sound right? You see preachers like Joel Osteen living in $10 million houses because he kind of presents a watered-down version of the truth of God's Word. Hmm. Um, you know, it's so much easier to cover things like, oh, seven ways to a better marriage, or God wants you to be prosperous, or how to live a better life. How to live a blessed life. Now, I'm not saying those topics don't matter. They do. God does want us to live a full and blessed life here on earth, but to ignore God's word, to ignore Bible prophecy, is to ignore up to a third of God's word. Some 28 to 33% of the Holy Bible is prophetic in nature. God tells you the end from the beginning. He tells you these things so you'll know that, yes, he alone is God. He alone is omniscient. He alone is omnipotent. He knows everything, including what's going to happen tomorrow, next month, next year, next millennium. He knows already. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The Bible says all of God's word is useful for teaching and instruction. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. That includes Bible prophecy. There's power in prophecy. Um, the prophetic scriptures in the Bible are very important. God promises that wherever he sends his word, it will prosper. Isaiah 55, verse 11. This includes all of his word, not just those cherry-picking verses that people like to pick and choose. It's all of God's word. Prophecy points to Jesus Christ. All prophecy points to Jesus. Revelation 19, verse 10. It's the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Jesus himself said he came to fulfill the law and the prophets in Matthew 5, verse 17. The law and the prophets. What if the Magi had ignored Bible prophecy? What if they thought the study of Bible prophecy was a waste of time. They would have missed out on seeing one of the greatest 
visions of all time, seeing the baby Jesus? What if Simeon, in Luke 2, verse 25, had the attitude the Bible prophecy is irrelevant? He would have missed out on the greatest blessing of his life. What if Anna, in Luke 2, 36, had ignored Bible prophecy? She would have missed out on Jesus. Jesus demands that we watch and pray. It's not a distraction from God's word. It's diving into God's word. How come Jesus demands it? Jesus doesn't just suggest studying Bible prophecy. He commands us to study it, to stay alert, to keep watch. Mark 13, verse 33. Watch for what? It's obvious. Watch for his return. The Bible gives us all kinds of signs of his return. Things that'll lead up to it. No man knows the day or hour, but we can know the time and season. Otherwise, if we're not watching and praying, he'll find us sleeping or not faithfully serving when he arrives. Mark 13, 36. So if you don't study Bible prophecy and the signs of his coming, how will you ever know what to watch for? And if you don't know what to watch for, how can you obey Jesus? Bible prophecy proves that the Bible is God's word. God said, who else can tell the end from the beginning? Or the beginning from the end. Isaiah 41, verse 21 and thereabouts. God proclaims that he alone can do this. God also lets us know only he can tell us what's going to happen before it happens. Isaiah 46, verse 10. There's hundreds and hundreds of Bible prophecies. And every single one of them, if they haven't already come true, will come true. What other book on the earth can predict power, can predict truth? None. Prophecy is a great tool for evangelism. Bible prophecy was used in the first century to spread the gospel. Peter cited the Messianic prophecies as clear proof that Jesus was the long way to Messiah in Acts 2, verses 14 through pretty much the rest of the, of the chapter. His speech led 3,000 people to give their lives to Christ. He also said the life of Jesus fulfilled what the prophets had written about, about the Messiah in Acts 3, uh, verse 18 and, and after. Philip, uh, Philip used um, uh, fulfilled prophecy to help explain the, the Gospels to the Ethiopian Enoch in Acts 8. Paul was spreading the Gospel, reading from Scripture. He explained how Jesus fulfilled the prophecies of the Messiah. And after he explained all that the prophets said about him, people came to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, Acts 13. So if you don't study Bible prophecy, you're probably missing out one of the greatest tools for spreading the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Um, prophecy encourages living a righteous lifestyle. You know, if you're keeping your eyes fixed on Christ and you know he could return at any moment, uh, it encourages us to try to live a holy life, right? Trying to live righteously. You know, when Jesus told the story of that evil servant, he, he warned us about danger. The danger of thinking, oh, he'll delay his return. Jesus said the evil servant thinks, oh, my master won't be back for a while, and he goes on sinning. Matthew 24, verse 48. We should live our life like Christ could return at any moment because he could. This leads us to be patient, like James 5 8 talks about. It leads us to be uh, discipled in our prayers, 1 Peter 4, verse 7. It leads us in love, 1 Peter 4, verse 8. And it brings us to a point of wanting to use the gifts and talents that God gave us for his glory, 1 Peter 4, verses 10 and 11. And then when we're, we're waiting for the return of Christ, we'll live peaceful, pure, and blameless lives, 2 Peter 3, 11 through 14. Prophecy gives specific blessings. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Revelation. I've been in the cave where John received this revelation of Christ. It's a message from Christ. It's a message of Christ. A crown of righteousness. Prophecy reveals the season of the Lord's return. Jesus said the world will be caught unaware when he suddenly returns, Luke 12, 40. It'll be like the days of Noah and Lot. People will go on their daily lives until the day of destruction. But those who study Bible prophecy won't be surprised by his return. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 4 through 6. We'll understand the signs. We'll know what we're looking at. We'll know the day or the season of his return. 
Jesus said, when you see all those things coming together, you can know his return is very near, Matthew 24, verse 33. So don't ignore Bible prophecy. Don't make fun of it. Don't discredit it. Prophecy is behind almost every promise that Christians cling to. The promise of heaven, the hope of salvation, the joy of eternity with Jesus Christ, the return of our Savior and King. These are promises from God. What is pro prophecy if it's not a, a guarantee of future events from God himself? So don't let others make fun of you. Don't let them discourage you from diving into Bible prophecy. You know, the world mocked Jesus. They ridiculed him. They laughed and mocked him and scorned him. So if you follow him, guess what? You're going to be laughed at, ridiculed, and mocked also. Matthew 10, 22 through 25. Bible prophecy is the message of Jesus Christ. And as a follower, as a servant of Christ, you have to be willing to endure persecution for his name. Jesus said, if anyone's ashamed of him and his message, he'll be ashamed of the, that person when he returns. Luke 9, 23 through 26. So don't be ashamed. Study Bible prophecy. Learn it. Dive into it. Let it enrich your life and lead you. Because the whole purpose of prophecy is to glorify Jesus. And after all, isn't that what we're here to do? I love you guys. God bless you. Good Lord willing. I'll see you again tomorrow.